Y'all can grab a seat. Welcome everyone watch online. I just want you to tell you, you maybe you came and you had a really crappy week. It's going to get better. Tell, turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to get better. It's about to get better, y'all. Okay? You need to know that it's going to be okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, man, we're going to have some fun today. Woo! We had some fun this morning. It was crazy in here. I don't know if you heard, but it, we just baptized over 50 people already. It's been crazy. God is doing a work. God is doing a work. I was, I was preparing for this message, and I was, it reminded me as I was preparing uh, of a story. Uh, it, was, it was a while back, but I was, sitting, I was sitting out back, and I, you know, I don't know about you, but like I, had, I like to have that time with God in the morning, and I had got, got a, this fresh cup of coffee, man. I was just like, oh, and I got a little fireplace outside. I turned the fireplace on, and everything was just perfect, and I was ready, about ready to spend some time with God, and, and then a smell. And, and I can't even, I've been thinking all week how to turn, describe this smell to y'all. Um, and the best I can come up with is like if you took like a, a, a Nacho Bel Grande from Taco Bell and that Nacho Bel Grande were to enter a relationship with like a double double with animal fries from in and out what that would produce as it exited humanity, that's what I smelled. It was bad. And so immediately I'm thinking, where's Levi? He's my son. He's my 18 year old son. And uh, who just went to prom last night. And his prom date's here. I see you, Faith. Oh, yeah. But I was thinking, no, and Levi wasn't home, so it was the only one that was home was Stella. And I'm like, nah, it wasn't Stella, right? So I didn't figure it out. Later that day, I go into uh, our bathroom, and the bathtub in the master bath had backed up. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're on a septic tank. And so it turns out the septic tank was, was full. So I did what anyone would do. I called the stool bus. That's the stool bus, y'all. Oh, yeah, and I could go through the different, the different characters on the stool bus. We could really have some fun. Oh, man, I'll freak the new people out, though. So I, I, it's like a, an acquired taste. You just take, you, you, it'll, you, you. I'll grow on you or you'll leave. I don't know which Who comes first. Hopefully I grow on you. But um, here's the point. Is, is that septic tank was full. And when something's full, it leads to a faulty flow. You follow me? We're week two of this series we're calling Make Room, where we're talking about how to make room for what's important and who is important. We're busy. We live busy lives, and, and sometimes we fail to make room. Kind of like what happened in my septic tank. When things get full, your flow gets backed up, and it causes all sorts of problems in our life. Maybe someone's suffering from a, a, a faulty flow, and, and your relationships, they begin to have a stench to them, or, or, or your health, or your spiritual walk with Christ. All of a sudden, it's like there's an odor, and, and God sent me, the stool bus, sorry, you'll never look at me the same again, to, to, to share this word, and this word is this. God says, it's time to fix your flow. John, fix your flow. Fix our flow. And the way we fix our flow is we make room for Jesus. When you make room for Jesus, that flow becomes efficient. That flow in your life becomes effective. Those relationships and all the different things that in, in your life, they begin to flow properly. Why? Because we've made room for what and for who is important. It's time to fix your flow. Second Kings Chapter four, verse one, there's a woman here that had a serious issue with her flow. In fact, her husband, who she loved, just died. And to make matters worse, he owed money, and the creditor to whom he owed money was coming to take her boys as ransom. You see, according to Hebrew law, that would be permissible to take the, the, the children as payment for that debt. And so she had a jacked up flow. She was about to lose everything and Elisha shows up, and Elisha, the cool thing about him is this, this man that died, her husband, was actually a servant of Elisha. So he shows up and says, girl, it's time to fix your flow. Here's how it happens. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. 
but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied, how can I help you? Tell me what you do have. Say, do have. Tell me what you do have in your house. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a, a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask for a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons pour the oil into all the jars and each and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. The oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and she said, and he said, go sell your oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Lord, I thank you. What happens for this reminder of what happens, God, when we make room? Forgive us, God, for our congested lives, but help us today through your spirit, make room and help us fix the flow in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so she, she's got nothing there at all, nothing there at all except a little jar of olive oil. Isn't it cool how when God does a work in our life, he almost always starts with something that's already there. We pray for something that we don't have, that we need, but we really don't need it oftentimes because something that he wants to do, it's already there in a very small form, but it's gonna get bigger. God's gonna do something big with it, but it's already there. And it's not lost on me like that the, if this all started, with the one thing in her whole house. She didn't have jack dilly squat, but she had this little jar. And God's like, oh, that's not so little. God, when you make room for a little, God can do a lot. Oh yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, God can do a lot with a little. Ooh, God can do a lot with a little. You need, maybe you need some examples. How about John 6? This dude had a little lunch, five loaves and two fish. And God said, oh, that ain't so little. I can do a lot with that, fed 5,000, right? Or how about uh, the Peter in, in Luke 5? He had some little nets that were empty. And God said, oh, I can fill those suckers up and feed a whole lot of people. Or how about Exodus 14? Moses over the, the Red Sea, I, 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 got a, I got a little staff. That staff can be used to part the seas and free, oh, approximately 2 million Israelites. God can do a lot with a little, but we gotta make room. And see, some of you think I'm some sort of salesman. You think, ah, oh, he's just saying that because it alliterates well, or he's got a bunch of jaded, butthurt Christians. <laughs> like, no. Listen, I'm just speaking what God told me to speak and, and, and from the story. It's his story. I'm just entering his story and, and saying, look, y'all, if you make room for a little, God can do a lot. And I think a lot of us, we miss the work of God and we have a jacked up flow, a faulty flow because we look for God in the grandiose, the big, the, 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 the big stuff. He's gotta be in the big. God, do a big work in my life. I pray that you move heaven and earth, God. Move heaven and earth in my life. There's a preacher's. How about you just move your butt out of the seat and start serving? Wait till you find out what happens. When, when we get our minds off our own crap and, and we begin to align our hearts with what God's doing. I'm telling you, I, God, uh, it's funny because Elisha, who we're reading about, had a predecessor, a mentor, Elijah. And Elijah learned this lesson from God. You remember when he, he went to this place called Mount Carmel, you can read about it, and um, he defeated these prophets of Baal, and it was this really epic moment, right? And then all of a sudden, this cray-cray lady named Jezebel starts chasing him, and he's like, I'm out, and he starts running, and he goes to Mount Horeb, this mountain, and he's like, okay, I'm out of it. God shows up and says, hey, stand on the mountain. My spirit's gonna, gonna be here. And he's like, okay, okay. And then all of a sudden, you remember what happened? All of a sudden, there's this, this wind, but the Bible says he wasn't in the wind. But then there's this big earthquake. The, the ground starts shaking at the mountain. And he's like, the Bible says 
He wasn't in the earthquake. Then fire descends upon that mountain. He must be in the fire. The Bible says, no, he wasn't in the fire. Then, after the fire came a gentle whisper. He was in the whisper. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. He was in the whisper. And see, sometimes we miss, we miss what God has for us because we, got, we, can't, we don't think that he can show up in the small things. We don't think that he could show up in, in something so minute, something so meaningless. And God says, oh, no, no, no. When you make room for me, <laughs> oh, I can, do, I can do a lot with a little. The, the, the widow had to understand this principle that, 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 that God could do a lot with a little. And, and friends, I, God keeps teaching me in very practical ways these lessons. Like this week, he literally showed me this on a plane to, uh, to California. I went there for a cohort of pastors that got together. And, and uh, so I was there flying to Oceanside. Well, yeah, really cool, right? Well, it wasn't so cool is uh, the only plane that could get me there at the time I needed to be there was Frontier Airlines. <laughs> Anybody ever flown Frontier? Well, this was Johnny's first time. And let me tell you, it was miserable. I get on the plane. And I sit down and I go to recline my seat. For whatever reason, that seat had no recline button. I'm like, looking where this thing's at. No, no reclining seat. Then I go to let my tray table down, but it's not a tray table on Frontier. Oh, no, no. It's a tray coaster. <laughs> it's about this big. And so I'm trying to work on the plane with my computer. And it's like, it, there's the, I couldn't even, couldn't even work. Oh, and to make matters worse, you know how much it costs? Well, if you're Southwest, your bags fly free. Not on Frontier. If you want your bag to fly on Frontier, it's $79.99 for your bag to fly. And I'm thinking to myself, if I'm going through this kind of persecution in, 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 this, in, the, in the coach, I can only imagine what my, my baggage is going through. You know, I don't know what it, it went through, but it had to be miserable. Then I got this kid behind me. You ever get the kid? He's kicking the seat. Just straight kicking the seat. iPad cranking, listening to the wiggles. Okay, I got PTSD from my kids growing up on the Wiggles. Okay, I got to listen to this, and I'm like, okay, mom's sitting right next to him. And y'all, I got my find and follow Jesus bracelet on. <clears throat> and I'm about to unload our mama back there. And here's the thing. My wife wasn't with me, so there was nothing to restrain me. Nothing to hold me back from going off on this lady and saying, girl, control your kid. There was nothing there except a little. A little love. And I mean little. A little restraint. A little seeing a bigger picture, not knowing what kind of hell they might be walking through. A little faith. You see, we pray, oh God, and this, God spoke this to me, like, you know, I hear people, I, I'm going to pray that I have enough faith to, to, to change the world. And here's what God spoke to me. You don't need enough faith to change the world. You just need enough faith to change your mind. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Woo! Oh yeah, that'll preach. Because the widow, she just had to believe just enough to say, you know what? That prophet is half crazy, but... Maybe, just maybe, the God that he worships and that, that I worship, maybe he's big enough to do a lot with a little. Enemy whispers, you can't. Hmm. Little whispers, oh yeah, you can. Maybe a fear says, oh, you won't. Little says, you will. Maybe your past says, oh, you're damaged. But little says, no, no, you're delivered. Or maybe it's a doctor that whispers, you know what, it's, it's terminal. Little says, no, no, it's a testimony. It's a testimony. Don't you know one of the people we had baptized today? I didn't know she was going to be baptized. Her name is Cheyenne. She's in her uh, young adults group. She's got cancer. And she's got, according to the doctors, three weeks to live. Three weeks to live. And you say, oh, why are you telling us that, Pastor? That's so sad. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Set your mind on eternity. This life is a vapor. 
And let me tell you something. Cheyenne, she preached my message in a way I couldn't today because what does she have left? Maybe a little time if God doesn't heal. And God, we know God can heal, and he could, and, and, and yea, God, if he does. But in, by the way, one way or another, either here or in eternity, she will be healed. Amen? But she says, well, you know, what do I have left? I've got maybe if, if, if the Lord doesn't heal on this side of eternity, a little time left. And she says, but you know what? She just did a lot with a little because now I'm telling her story. And it, it causes us to examine what we can do with that little that we have in our life. Amen? Amen. Uh, t- today, we're supposed to have about, the number keeps growing. It, it was 113, but now it's going to be probably about 118 is, is between two services of because the numbers keep growing. People, but here's, here, here's what I'll say. Here, here's, here's what I want to point to you. Okay, number one, well, first of all, number one, wow, God, like that doesn't happen in most churches, okay? So give God praise for that. That is, Okay. Like, we're living revival. This is revival. It's right in front of our eyes. And, and so, so, number one, that's pretty cool. But, but I want to remind you where this, where this began. March 30th, 2018, the first gathering service, the first gathering was actually in my backyard. And we had a little service there, about maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe 100 people, right? And that night, we had our first baptism in my hot tub. Check it out. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that was, that was Ethan. That was your boy. Ethan's mama's here, and you were there. See? It started with a little. And so you see 118 people, whatever the number's gonna be today, and you're like, yeah, it's easy to see that on this side of the miracle, on this side of the anointing, on this side of the blessing. But what about when it was little? Someone had to see that God could do a lot with a little. Amen. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Hmm. Wait a second. Why would he involve the neighbors? Like good students of the Bible, we ask good questions. A good question at this time would be like, why, why mess around with the neighbors? Like, it, it, why, why include them in the process? It's kind of, you know, they're busy. The flow could have come from the Father. But the purpose of making room and fixing your flow, it ain't just about you, Jack. It's not about just these three people in the story, the mama and the two boys. Uh-uh. It's about a city that needs Jesus. Your flow is connected to somebody else's future. You hear me? Your flow is connected to somebody else's future. Let me, uh, let me illustrate this. Uh, uh, are, you, are you new? Is it your first time? Are you just here for, to watch somebody be baptized? Oh, I shouldn't use you. But, but then again, if I upset him, he leaves, he was gonna leave anyways. Come on up here, brother, come on up here. So, so, you're, so tell me, what you, what's your name? Ernesto, come on up here, Ernesto. Ernesto. There you go. All right, so you look like a nice neighbor, right? Will you be my neighbor? Yeah. Won't you be my neighbor? Okay. All right, so why involve Ernesto, right? Like, why go through all the trouble? You say, well, Pastor John, the story is about empty jars, right? Empty jars. It is about empty jars. But which empty jars are we talking about? The empty jars that were loaned, thinking about that? Because God's about to do some really cool miracle. I know you're not going to believe me, but he's going to fill this with oil out of that little thing over there. And it's crazy. I know. I know. I get it. But I'll be back in about, I don't know, a couple hours. And I'm about to show you what he's going to do, Okay. No, 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 no. You want to preach, Ernesto? Go ahead. No, I'm kidding. Okay, just work with me, okay? So God's going to do something, right? Why involve this jar of clay? Okay, but what's the story really about? A jar of clay. Okay, I get it. It's about a jar of clay. Which jar of clay, Ernesto? This one? The one that's being loaned? Or is the real story more about 
the jar of clay that might be lonely because what if Ernesto doesn't know Jesus? What jar of clay is the story really about? Because my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, you can see it on the screen. Put up there, guys. Ourselves, we are like fragile jars of clay containing great treasure. What, you mean, when, when I have Jesus Christ in my life, I have this che- treasure in this jar of clay. And, and the, the purpose and the plan is for me to share that light and life of Jesus Christ through my neighbors. You see, it turns out you not only gave a jar of clay, Ernesto, you were the jar of clay that Jesus wants to fill. Amen? Come on, give him praise. Come on. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you, man. Woo. Ernesto, you coming back? Okay. All right. You know liars go to hell. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Where was I? Um, I'm kidding. Here, here, let me give an example of how th- this, um, this, th- this flow is connected to someone's future. You guys heard, some of your visitors you don't know, but you heard me tell of, of, of Ginger who gets here every morning at 5 a.m., rides her bike, um, and she was living in the closet at a gym for a, a year, over a year, and lost her apartment. So she was living there at the gym where she worked, and she was uh, terminated last week. And so, you know, I shared how she didn't have a place to live. Well, one of our elders is like, and his wife come up to me at, uh, after last week's gathering and they came up and they said, and, I, and this is crazy. They said, hey, um, Pastor John, that thing of, that, that Ginger's going through, God really put on our heart that we, we wanna help her. And I said, well, what, what do you do? What, what, what do you have? And he said, well, kid you not, we have a little room in our house and it's empty. Ooh, hashtag message inspiration. Gave me, that, that's the message. It's like, oh, you know, we have this little room and we don't have a lot, but we got a little room and it's empty and we can, you know, hook her up. It's got its own bathroom. And, and don't you know, for the foreseeable future, and, and, and as of last Sunday, they, they, they gave her, so they're, you're living in the house and for, for the foreseeable future, you have a home. And not only that, there's someone else that came and gave a substantial amount of money to help fix a car and help get you some clothes and other things. And so, yay God, that's what it means to have a flow that's connected to someone's future. But the prophet is very clear. He says, and listen, he says, don't just ask for a few. Don't just ask for a few jars. Why? Because what we do today, the the faith that we display in this moment that we're in has implications on somebody's future. Don't just ask for a few jars. Now she didn't know that God was gonna keep filling, right? To all of the jars that she had. But he's saying in faith, just trust me, don't just ask for a few jars. Why is that important? Um, Okay, we're building a building. I don't know if you know this, we can't stay in mama's basement forever. I've told you that many times. And, and we are in the process of building. Uh, we are getting closer to permitting stage. So we're, we're going through this process. It's gonna be about two years before we're actually in the building, but we are working, I can promise you, weekly. A lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. And so we're excited about that. But it's 20 acres of land and, and we had planned on building like about an 1800 seat venue-ish, you know. And then God began to speak, speak to me like, you're not setting out enough pots. And so I went back to the builders, Pastor Michael and I, we said, hey, what's the biggest building we can build on that land and still have really good parking because our parking sucks? <laughs> Seth the Lord. I know you don't like the word, that word, so I'm, I'm gonna put Jesus behind it and he's cool with it, okay. It's bad parking, right? I, we get it. And so we're gonna have good parking at the new place. But what's the most, and you know what the number is? Basically, it's a, it's a 2100 seater. Now you can say, oh, that's awfully big, but we have a 1300 seater and look around, okay? And and we got two years to grow into that building. And so I'm so thankful that that God's saying, hey, a reminder saying, just don't just ask for a few, John, because people's lives, long after you're dead and gone, if he tarries, people 
will be affected. People will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of the word of God preached long after I'm gone. Why? Because somebody had enough faith to set out a few more pots. That's you and me. And, we're, and that's our moment. This is our moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it gets really peculiar right here. He says, go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Why? Why? I mean, isn't the, isn't the goal of the neighbors to involve the neighbors? Yes, in the right time. It turns out some of your neighbors ain't, it's too spiritually mature. And some of your neighbors can talk you out of your flow. In fact, I would submit that some people are here today and they have a, 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 a faulty flow, a jacked up flow. Why? Because you let somebody in the room that shouldn't be in the room and they spoke something over you to you and whew, that light was stolen. That destiny was stolen. That thing that God had for you through the path of obedience but took a little faith was robbed from you. Why? Because you let somebody in the room. Here's your point. Guard your flow. Guard your flow. Woo! Come on. Guard that flow because people will lie to you. People will deceive you. People will try to steal that flow that God, that is God given. And this week I got to spend, any skaters, any skater nerds in the house? Come on. Yeah. Oh, who said that? Oh yeah, yeah, you saw, you, you saw, yeah, you saw, I got to hang out with, uh, with Jamie Thomas this week. He's, for some of you guys who actually appreciate skateboarding, he's a, he's a legend in, uh, in the skating world. I mean, you know, like he was right there with Tony Hawk and all them. Uh, and so I got to hang out with him at this, at this uh, pastor's coalition. He's got a, just an incredible testimony. But here's what you might not know, is that he got saved. And back in 1999, after being saved, he released this board. It's a John 3.16 board, which I don't know if you know this story, Jason, but his, his sponsor said, do not do that. If you release that board, it will crush you because Christianity and skateboarding, it didn't mix, right? And so he said, whatever you do, don't do this. Well, you know what? He guarded his flow. And don't you know that became the number one selling skateboard of all time? Okay, so let me tell you about, let me introduce you to a guy named Eric who's connected to this story. Eric is on the right, Jamie's on the left there. Uh, the guy on the right, Eric, he's a pastor in Southern California. Four years earlier, before that skateboard came out, uh, he, he started, uh, in 1995, he started a, uh, a skate park. And at that skate park, you know, it, it was kind of, it wasn't that successful as, as it could have been, right? Like it was kind of like, okay, but not great. And all of a sudden, this Jamie Thomas comes on the scene, this, this born again Christian. And all of a sudden people are like, oh, it's kind of cool to skate and, and also to love God, right? And, and then the skateboard comes out. And then now, and, and by the way, it's a, he, he was a whole different kind of skater. He's a street skater. Tony Hawk was more into verticality, all the jumps and everything. And so now these, these young people who didn't know Christ and were troubled teens, all of a sudden they're coming to the skate park and like, I want to be like Jamie Thomas. And they're bringing their skateboards. They're bringing these John 3, 16. And why is that important? Because a lot of these parents, they wouldn't let him even go to the skate park because, oh, we don't want you to hang out at a skate park until that board came out. Until that board that the guy told him never to release. Until that came out, it was a game changer. And Eric, at this convention, the pastor, tells Jamie, he says, looks him in the eye, almost like with tears in his eyes, says, you have no idea what that board did and the impact that it made for Jesus Christ on the teenagers that I got to lead. You see what I'm saying? Your flow that we need to guard is connected to somebody's future. And so here's what I want you to do. Here's a practical takeaway from a spiritual truth. You need to begin to separate the depositors from the drainers in your life. There are those that deposit to your flow, hang around with them. I got a lot of them. There's a couple of them were standing over there. Is that, is that Ken? Yeah, you're a depositor in my life. So is Pastor Aaron. Big Mikey P, he's a depositor. Brad and Christy, they're depositors. See, I hang out with people. Now, if, if you're evangelizing, that's a different story. Sometimes, you know, you need to be hanging around with messy people. Be careful because even that can get, that can lead you down the wrong path if you're not careful. But some of you have drainers in your life. People 
who will drain your flow. They're always about drama, always about what you're not, always about, oh, it's so heavy and it's so, oh, you're never gonna, like, get rid of the drainers because they're draining your flow. God's filling it up and it's going right out through them. And God says, get rid of them. Oh, but that's not the love of Jesus. Timing is everything. God can bring them back around, but I wanna en enable you and empower you to release those unhealthy people out of your life and hold on to the depositors. You say, but how do I know, Pastor John, if they're a depositor or a drainer? Give them the... Philippians test. Okay, you're not nearly as sinful as the first. I said flip test and the people went wild thinking I was gonna like, you know, give, give someone the bird or something. The Philippians 4.13 test. Some of you know that verse, Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ. And a depositor will remind you that you can do all things. Uh, someone who's a, a drainer is gonna say, I can do, you can do small things. And yes, yes, God's work starts small, but in totality, when they come into fruition, what it creates is something massive and big. So if they're saying, oh, you can only do small things, get behind me, Satan. I can do all things through my God. I can baptize people in a hot tub and it can lead to a revival. It can lead to a movement of God. Don't tell me that it can't happen because it can happen. It can happen in your life and it happened in my life. <laughs> Depositors are gonna help you fix your flow. God, God does it, but so often he sends people to help address things in our life. Verse six, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And the oil stopped flowing. Your flow, my flow, is equal to our faith. The flow in your life is equal to the faith you display. If your oil has stopped flowing, it's not because God ran out of oil. It's because we haven't made room in our life. We haven't set out enough jars to allow God to fill and 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 to fill. And to fill. Because the filling was proportional to the faith. I, I know she's kicking herself. Oh man, I just went, I, I wish I went to Lisa's house. She has, I know it's a far walk, but man, she had a couple jars too. And Kevin's house, man, he's got, he's got like three or four jars. You see what I'm saying? It was equal to the faith, equal to the faith. Go and sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. More room equals more blessing. You want blessing over your life. You want blessing over your kids. You want blessing over your family. Make more space because the flow was equal to the faith. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be a church of faithless people that squeak into eternity by the, by the skin of our teeth, man. Like God's called us to more. God's called us to live. God's called us to be his vessels that believe that the stories we read about in the Bible ain't just for somebody else, but God's writing a unique story through us and that we are the Bibles that people read, right? Because some people don't own this. And so they get to see this, the truth of this woman and her faith. They get to see it through our faith as we go to work, as we go to the gym, as we live our lives, realizing that we're the jars that the story's referring to. You and me are the jars of clay. Here's your assignment. Set out more jars. This week, I want you to begin to set out more jars, trusting that God will fill the very jars that you set out. You test him. You see if that's not true. You see if God's not faithful. 
here's, here's what that looks like. Let me give you a couple suggestions on what, what it means to set out some, some jars. Give God the first 10. The first 10 minutes of your day, give them to God. Now, some of you already give more time than that. That's fine. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking for maybe new believers that don't spend time daily with God. Give God 10 minutes of your day, five minutes in prayer. Oh, but I don't know how to pray, Pastor John. Prayer, prayer is just talking to God. God, I feel like crap today. And, and you know, I don't know. I, I got a lot on my mind. I know you can fix this. I know you can help my flow. God, just, just help me. Help me. I'm trusting you. There you are. You're praying. Okay? The second five minutes, spend reading the Word of God. And if you want to jump, you say what, what you read, you can jump on Gathering Church AZ, our Gathering app, and you can jump on there. And, and we have a reading plan. You can jump in on that reading plan. And if you don't want to do the reading plan, start in the, the Gospel of John, read a chapter a day. And you watch what God does when you begin to give God the first 10. Second thing, get in a group. If you're not in a group, don't complain about your life. Because the way God fixes the flows most often is through people, through community, through relationship. That's God's plan. Don't complain about something you have the ability to fix. Get in the group. The way you do that, you can go on our gathering app and sign up there, or you can stop out at our, our, um, our new here, or sorry, not new here, our um, next class, sorry, next class. Stop there, the next area, and sign up for the next class, and in the next class, it will get you plugged into biblical community where you will thrive and you will grow and that flow will be fixed. And lastly, I would say this, tell your story to people. Tell your story. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame the evil one, that's Satan, by the blood of the lamb, that's Jesus, and the word of their testimony, that's your story my story. Oh, but it's just a little story. Oh, don't you start. We already covered that. We already covered what God can do with a little story. Turns out that little story might just be what your coworker needs to hear. Just what a family member needs to hear. Just what someone sitting next to you might need to hear. Tell the world your story. One of the ways you can do that too is, uh, is you can share your 60 second story. Remember we talked about that? Your 60, share your 60 second make room story. Just send your video to Instagram at Gathering Church AZ. But what is, what is the story? I made room by doing this, and this is what God did. Simple. Do that. Let your people know that God is alive and well in your life, and God is fixing your flow. Let me pray for you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to pray for those with a. Maybe, you're, maybe you came today and you just like you have an issue with the, the flow in your life. We live in a world that has a jacked up flow. Just turn on your TV and see what Iran is doing to Israel, right? Dropping bombs on people. That, that's a, that's a, a flow issue. We live in a world where God is calling you and me to rise up and be the answer to, to somebody's prayer. God, I pray for Israel. Well, what if God's calling you to answer that prayer? What, what if God's calling us to answer that prayer? God, I pray for our nation as, as, as the Easter week has, has turned into transgender visibility. No, it's Easter. It's Easter. And, and, and we welcome you. We welcome messy people. But like Easter belongs to Jesus. And, and it's our job to remind the world through love that, that there is healing for sick and broken people. What if we are the answers to the prayers that people are praying? Heavenly Father, I lift up every person. I thank you for the work you're doing in our lives. I thank you for the flows that maybe are a little faulty at this moment. God, I pray that we would be reminded of the truth, God, that even amidst some of our faults, you find this mustard seed of faith and you say with a mustard seed, it's enough to move a mountain. I pray that you move a mountain in our life through the small things that turn out to be big things. I pray, God, that you would connect our story. As imperfect as that story might be, you would connect us with our neighbors that need to know the love of Christ, need to see the Bible that we read lived out in the way we love 
people that live next door. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I pray for every person that we would guard the flow that you've given to us, protect it as it grows, as it becomes more effective. I pray, God, that you would, uh, <laughs> you would safeguard it and help us do the same, realizing that you're doing a bigger work than we'll ever know. The story is greater than we might ever know. Help us, Lord, as we become the vessels you've called us to be, jars of clay full of powerful treasure that the world needs. Thank you, God, for the evidence of that through water baptism. These lives and the people that are saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. God has fixed and is fixing my flow. Thank you, Lord, for that tangible representation of an inward work that you're doing. We give you praise. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. As you clap your hands, would you get up off your butt? We are going to celebrate these life transformations. These are stories. These are truth. These are people's lives. We are celebrating the flows that God is fixing as people are declaring to the world, I'm making room. Come on, make some noise if you, if you see Jesus in this place today. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you see the life transformation, give him some praise before you get some lunch. Woo! Don't forget what happened today. We'll talk about this in eternity. God is doing a work in our lives. All we have to do is make room and he does the rest. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you back next week.